let's start talking about radiation and spectra. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, we're going to be studying how we learn about things that are really far away. Um, we're stuck on Earth, so we want to talk about the behavior of light, the electromagnetic spectrum, spectroscopy in astronomy, the structure of the atom, uh, the formation of what are called spectral lines, and the Doppler effect. All of this is background information for you to understand how we analyze the light coming to us from space and what it can tell us about the things we're looking at. So that's your goal, just through all this stuff you might be thinking this is a little bit weird, but we need to understand how all this works so you can trust the observations that we're going to talk about. So the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is 100,000 uh, years away by uh, Boeing 737 or uh, the fastest spacecraft we've ever managed to make. How could we possibly study um, its properties from here? The answer is in the analysis of the light that's coming from it, uh, which is called the study of radiation. So by studying its uh, radiation emitted by that star, we can learn a lot about its properties, and you're going to learn how much we can learn about it. So that's Alpha Centauri, the closest star system to us. Um, in This is an optical light, so this is what you would see if you had uh, eyes powerful enough to, to see it. X-ray is what you would see if you had Superman eyes, X-ray vision. But you can see Alpha Centauri is actually two stars um, next to each other. It's actually, there's a third star orbiting both of those. So, uh, behavior of light. So what we want to learn out of section 5.1 is to explain Maxwell's electromagnetic theory of light, describe the relationship between wavelength, frequency, and the speed of light, and then discuss the particle model of light and then how that relates to uh, the wave-like nature and this idea of the photon, which is the particle of light. And then we want to explain how and why the amount of light we see from an object depends on how far away it is. So, um, coded within the light from an object is detailed information about the object itself. If we can decipher the code, if we can learn about what, how light contains information, we can learn about the cosmos without ever leaving Earth. Um, visible light that we see, that is being reflected off of me right now, and other radiation that comes from uh, stars and planets is generated by processes at the atomic level. And to understand how light is generated, we have to understand a little bit about how atoms work. So we're going to do that uh, right now. When I talk about, and when this book talks about light and other radiation, um, we're talking about light and other radiation because light is just one type of radiation. The visible light that we see is just one type of radiation that is a type that our eyes can see. Other types are Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, so we have to talk about what radiation means. All things radiate. I'm radiating now. If you've ever seen the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger, he the predator can see infrared, so he has to cover himself with cold mud to hide the infrared sensor from him. So he's a radiating infrared light. Um, generally, when you think of radiation, it's a scary word, um, like plutonium or some radioactive substance or Chernobyl or something. But not all radiation is harmful. Most radiation is not harmful, and it's actually how we see things. There's radiation coming from something hitting your eye, and your eye is responding to that radiation, and our brain is interpreting that as vision. A single atom can radiate 120 million photons per second, a single atom, so there's a lot of photons out there. And in astronomy, in our field and what we're going to be talking about today, the word radiation refers to electromagnetic radiation, which is light waves being emitted by an object. So when I talk about radiation in class, um, or when I describe radiation in this book, I'm specifically talking about uh, light being emitted by an object. So this guy, James Clerk Maxwell, um, he's basically the Newton of electricity and magnetism, and uh, he created the theory that linked electricity and magnetism together, and there's a set of equations called Maxwell's equations, which govern the, uh, which talk about the behavior of light. Um, to kind of understand this, we have to go back to the atom itself. So think about a positively charged proton at the nucleus of an atom surrounded by a charge uh, by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. Maxwell's theory deals with the charges, um, especially the moving charges. If a charge starts to move, what happens? Um, we know that electric 
uh, negatively charged particles will repel each other, but if you get a negative and a positive together, they will attract each other, and that's why electrons are orbiting a positive nucleus. They're attracted to it. That's called an electric force. Um, when we see particles at rest, we can put little, we can see forces on them. We call it those electric forces, but when a charged particle, like an electron, starts moving, we generate uh, an effect called magnetism, or the electrons do. So Maxwell's theory established um, these things called electric fields and magnetic fields, and it's just when an electron moves, it can exert a force nearby, and it has to transmit that force through space. So we think of space being filled with a field, um, an electric field or a magnetic field. Um, and you, you've known that if you bring a magnet near a paperclip, it goes up to it. Well, I had to have some force at a distance, so we called that a field theory. Um, Maxwell realized that by doing these measurements that a magnetic field generates an electric field, and then an electric field can generate a magnetic field. If the electric field is changing, it will automatically uh, create a magnetic field and vice versa. So, once you start an electromagnetic wave, it self-propagates. It continues to promote itself, and it becomes self-sustaining. Um, these waves move at the speed of light, and that's when Maxwell realized what he was studying was light itself. Um, so, these are called electromagnetic waves, and sometimes you'll hear it as electromagnetic radiation, and it's just, that's light. That's what we call light. So, when you see light, when you heat something up in a microwave, when you change the channel with a remote control, all electromagnetic radiation, all different types. When you're using Wi-Fi, calling on a cell phone, all that. So electromagnetic radiation can be modeled like waves rippling across a pond. Uh, these electromagnetic waves carry information from one place to another uh, through space. It's how cell phones work, radios work, the antenna in your car, listening to the radio, Wi-Fi, everything. Your eyes are antenna for visible light. Your car has an antenna for FM and AM radio. Your cell phones have an antenna for Wi-Fi. All the same thing, just different energies, different spectra of electromagnetic radiation. So you got a little frog here vibrating, and as it vibrates, it creates these ripples. And if you uh, can see in that, um, uh, the little waves there rippling away, we can think of light waves as the same thing. You can think of this frog as emitting light waves, uh, similar to those water sound waves. So one difference between these water waves and the electromagnetic waves is that Water waves require water. You have to have water to transmit water waves. You can't go surfing on the air. You need water, right? Um, without water, you have no waves. But electromagnetic waves, they propagate through empty space. They require no medium. That's a key thing. In space, they can't hear you scream. You may have heard that from the movie Alien, I think. Um, when there's no air to transmit your sound waves, you can't hear anything. But we see light traveling across the universe. So it turns out that we've learned light does not require a medium to propagate in. It is the universe itself, the fabric of the universe, the space itself is enough for light to travel. So there's no medium in between the stars necessary to transmit light. That's cool. So all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed through empty space, and that's called the speed of light. Doesn't matter whether it's Wi Fi signals, visible light, a flashlight, your infrared thing, it's all going at the speed of light. That speed is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or 186,000 miles per second. Um, you know there are different types of light red light, green light, yellow light, infrared light, UV light, go get a tan, X rays, see through your bones, gamma rays, have a tumor removed, microwaves, heat up your food, all those different types of waves. Um, travel at the same speed, and they're all light. It's all the same electromagnetic radiation. So what's different about them? The difference is that they have different wavelengths or different frequencies. What is a wavelength? It's literally the length between waves. <laughs> how far apart are, if we're thinking of light as a water wave, how far apart do the waves hit you when you're at the beach? How long does it take? Well, what's the distance between them? That's what a wavelength is. And some waves have uh, really short wavelengths. Some wavelengths have really long wavelengths. Some have really short wavelengths. That's the difference um, between the energies of light. That's it. That's how you can think about it. They all travel at the same speed, different wavelengths, different frequencies. Our eyes can see Roy G. Biv. That's a guy's name if you want to remember it. Uh, a mnemonic. Okay, Roy G. Biv stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. They're the colors of the rainbow. Um, and that's the 
full spectrum of colors that our eyes can see. Um, before red, on this side of red, you can think of there's infrared there that our eyes can't see, snakes can see, and after violet is ultraviolet. Our eyes can't see them, but bees can see ultraviolet light. The equation that relates this, C stands for the speed of light, and it's the same. So if you're going to increase the wavelength, you have to decrease the frequency. If you're going to increase the frequency, you've got to decrease the wavelength. They're proportional to each other. Um, and that's what this equation is just telling you. You don't have to calculate anything, but that's um, the speed of light's constant. So if you've got to change the wavelength, you've got to change the frequency. They're related to each other. So when I talk about colors of light or frequencies of light or different types of electromagnetic radiation, I'm talking about changing the wavelength, shrinking it down, lengthening it out. So when I talk about wavelengths like nanometers and meters and centimeters and kilometers, I'm talking about the distance between the, the waves. So light can be treated as both a wave and a particle. It has momentum like a particle, but it can interfere like a wave. Uh, in this book, we are going to generally treat light like a wave, but sometimes we'll refer to it as a particle. doesn't really matter. Um, as far as you're concerned, it's situa situationally dependent, and uh, you should just be aware that I might interchange between them, um, but it's basically both a particle and a wave at the same time, and we call that theory quantum mechanics um, that deals with the mathematics of that, uh, but um, you don't have to spend too much time trying to understand that, unless you want to, and come talk to me. Okay, so a light bulb. It gets dimmer the further away the light bulb is. Makes sense, right? As I move away from this, it should get dimmer. If I get closer to it, it should get brighter. Okay, this is the result of an inverse square law. Just like gravity gets weaker the further away planets are away from each other, uh, light gets dimmer the further away you are from a light source. The important thing is that there's a very specific mathematical relationship, which means you can predict how it's going to work um, based on how bright an object is, how far away it is, and how bright it appears to be at that distance. Why is this important? Because if we know how bright a star should be, and we measure its apparent brightness, or how bright it appears, then we can calculate using math how far away the star is. Or vice versa, if we know how far away the star is and we measure its apparent brightness, we can calculate what its absolute brightness is, and so on. So this is what you need to get out of this part, is just to know that there's, yeah, okay, light gets dimmer when you're far away from it, big deal but very specifically, you can calculate the difference between its brightness and how far away it is, okay? So that's what you need to get out of um, that uh, thing, that inverse square law. And this is just showing that light is spreading out into space as it moves away from an object, so it's getting diluted and it's being thinned out. So, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, what we want to understand out of here are what are the different bands of the ENM spectrum, how do they differ, and we want to understand how they interact with the atmosphere, um, and then explain how and why the light emitted by an object depends on its temperature, which is a really important thing. So the range of energies of light radiation that are possible comprise what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. This is x-rays to rage a bit backwards, um, to microwaves, to Wi-Fi signals, to whatever, so violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, infrared, and so on. All those things, that's all electromagnetic radiation. So what this chart is showing you, you've got your gamma rays, you've got your x-rays, you've got your UV, visible, infrared, microwave, radio, and so on. What you can see with your eyes is this rainbow, okay? What is totally available is this giant spectrum beyond our perception. You can feel infrared radiation. When you go in the sun, it feels warm. You can't see infrared, but you feel it. Um, UV light, you have no idea that it's happening to you, but suddenly you're tan or burned. Okay, so you respond to UV light even though you can't really see it or feel it until the next day. Um, X-rays, you have no idea. They just go right through you and you take a picture and then maybe it gives you cancer if you get enough X-rays. Gamma rays will destroy tissue and burn you uh, immediately. Uh, so you use that for cutting out tumors and things. Microwaves and radio and infrared and all of those things have no effect on you at all. You have no ability to sense them. Um, so that's why we use them for Wi-Fi and communications. Completely invisible to us. So what this is showing you is that optical light, a little bit of UV, and a little bit of infrared make it all the way to the ground. So telescopes that study vis visible light are on the ground. Uh, telescopes like radio telescopes, you might see these giant satellite dishes out there. Those are radio telescopes. Um, they can see, they can study what's called the radio window because radio waves make it all the way to the ground. 
But you can see there's a section here where infrared gets absorbed uh, by the atmosphere, and then there's a section over here, gamma, x-ray, UV light, it doesn't make it to the Earth. That's great because those are very harmful to us, so we're glad that the atmosphere protects us from those. They damage our DNA. Um, but we need to put telescopes in space and that's what these are showing you is that we've got ground-based telescopes for studying light that makes it to the ground and then we have uh, space-based telescopes that study wavelengths of light that we don't access on the ground so we got to put telescopes in space. Hubble is sort of the exception um, but that was because we wanted to get it above the atmosphere so the images would be clearer and not so blurry uh, because the atmosphere causes haze and like, you know, pollution and stuff like that. Okay, so um, that's what this is showing you, the full electromagnetic spectrum, and then what you care about is that not all of it reaches the ground, and so we have certain telescopes on the ground and certain telescopes in space, and that's why we have those, okay? Um, these are typical sources of different types of radiation, so stars, visible light, you look up, you see the stars, so they emit a lot of visible light, your eyes can see. Infrared comes from clouds of gas and dust. Microwave comes from just background radiation, galaxies and other things. Radio comes from supernova remnants that blew up and now they're still emitting some radio waves. Cold gas, like at the center of the galaxy, we can study with radio waves. Um, X-rays come from really hot gas. Gamma rays come from uh, collisions of things and black holes and all sorts of crazy stuff. So we study those different objects by looking at those specific frequencies of light. So if I go back to that, um, the Chandra X-ray telescope is studying um, like uh, supernova remnants, like the uh, pulsar wind nebulas, the neutron stars, and things like that. Um, there's a gamma ray telescope that's studying these uh, active galactic nuclei, uh, and so on. Radio and microwave telescopes are studying the center of the galaxy here on Earth, and so on. So some objects emit infrared radiation, some emit gamma radiation, some emit microwaves, some emit visible light. What's the difference between these objects? Why do they emit these different things? What determines that? Turns out it's primarily their temperature. What is temperature? It's the motion of the atoms. The faster the atoms move, the higher frequency they move, the higher frequency of light they emit. That's the radiation. Higher energies have higher frequencies. Turns out that there's a cool law, a hot law maybe, called Wien's law. It relates the temperature of an object to its peak emission wavelength, it's peak color. Um, we think about stars as something called a black body. And a black body is a term uh, in physics refers to a thermodynamic object uh, that absorbs theoretically all the energy that falls onto it. And as it absorbs all the energy it starts to heat up. So if you've seen a fire it goes from red hot to white hot to blue hot and uh, it's changing colors based on its temperature. Okay, um, It changes color in a very precise, mathematically predictive way. It's called Wien's Law. So this is the emission of our star, the Sun, and this is the colors it emits, and then the height of it deter is uh, um, how much of that light. So it looks like m the strongest emission is in green, but then it also emits some red and blue on either side in about equal amounts. So that's why our star appears white, because um, red, green, blue light together makes white light. And so when you see white light, it's made of all the colors. If you see some red light, there's missing blue and green and so on. So our star, the sun, primarily emits in green, red, and blue, and that's what makes it white. But then there's this kind of tail um, into the red and infrared, which gives it a little bit of a yellow hue, okay? A little orangey, but mostly white, okay? So this is just a, what a black body looks like. Its emission spectrum looks like this, okay? This characteristic curve. It just has this kind of whoop, like that. And then the peak wavelength is determined by its temperature. So this is the equation for that. The peak wavelength is just this one number divided by the temperature. So easy. If you want to know the temperature of a star, you put T up here divided by lambda, and you can solve for what uh, the temperature of the star is if you measure its peak wavelength just divide it by one number, that's it. It's very crazy. So um, this spectrum is from a star that has a 5,000 Kelvin temperature. There's Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Those are temperature scales. 5,000 Kelvin is the temperature of our sun. It's a 5,500, 5,600, 5,700 Kelvin, something like that. Um, so there's Wien's law. If you put in the 5,525 into this equation for the temperature, then you get that the peak wavelength is 543 nanometers, 
and 543 nanometers is right there. So that's it. That's easy. You can measure that peak wavelength and then calculate the temperature of the star. So again, this whole chapter is about how do we learn about Alpha Centauri and other stars. We can't go there. Here's a really crazy thing. Just by measuring its emission spectrum, looking at its peak wavelength, measuring that, and just putting it in that equation, we can get its temperature or vice versa. It's really crazy. So that's called Wien's Law. Um, these are other stars. Other stars would have an emission out here. That's a 2500 Kelvin star. That's a cold star. That's a warmer star, warmer still, and then our sun. Okay, and that's just showing you that the peak wavelength is changing as you get to bluer and bluer stars. Okay, so those are the temperatures of these different stars, and those are their emission spectra. Okay, so um, measuring the color of a star tells us the temperature of the star. The spectrum shifts to blue to shorter wavelengths. Wien's law, what it means is hotter, the hotter the star is, the bluer the star is. So that's your most important thing to take away from this. Blue stars are hottest. Yellow stars are next hottest. White stars, red stars are cold. So we might usually have that backwards. Red on a faucet means hot, blue means cold. It's backwards with stars, okay? So Wien's Law says that blue stars are hot, red stars are cold, and white and yellow are in between. So this is the Orion constellation, and you can see Betelgeuse up here. You may have heard in the news that Betelgeuse is going to explode in the next 50,000 years, soon, um, maybe 100,000 years, uh, maybe tomorrow. And when it blows up, boom, uh, it'll, it'll be pretty bright because we can see it right now. But you, you can see it's red. These stars are nice and blue. And that's Rigel, very young, very blue star, high temperature. Um, so just by looking at stars, you'll start to see that they're all different colors. Why are they different colors? Because they're different temperatures. Okay, so um, studying the spectrum of a star then uh, is really important. So we want to understand now the properties of light, explain how we can determine the composition of a star by looking at its spectral lines and then discuss the different types of spectrum. Okay, so you can take light, you can reflect it off a surface like a mirror, but most importantly you can refract it through glass like a prism. Um, when you do that, light can be combined together. So white light is made of red, green, and blue. All the colors of light together make white light. So if you want to study what white light is made out of, you have to put it through a prism. Um, when that happens, the light is split into its component colors. So um, we use a prism to do that, and so if you have white light coming in, it ends up splitting the light into the rainbow that made up that light. So if you want to study the spectrum of light, um, you use a prism, and that device is called a spectrometer. Here's an actual beam of white light. You've got your reflected wave there, but there's your refracted wave getting split into its component colors. So that's really cool. Um, this study of the components of light is called spectroscopy. You're scoping the spectrum. Um, the tool used to study a spectrum is called a spectrometer. Um, so to understand this, let's take a quick little aside here. Um, the fundamental interaction is between scattering of photons and electrons. Everything that you experience is photons being scattered off electrons. Every atom is made of a nucleus, protons and neutrons together, surrounded by the electrons. Photons are globs of energy responsible for what we call light. Um, James Clerk Maxwell determined that all electromagnetic radiation is related. Uh, Einstein won a Nobel Prize for discovering that electromagnetic waves can be modeled by photons. And just like water is made of molecules of water, so H2O, light waves are made of countless numbers of photons. And all photons begin and end their life on electrons. There's no, you can't observe a photon directly. You can only observe its effect on electrons. So there's a really useful property about photons and electron scattering. The color of the scattered photon tells you what the electron belongs to. So that's your takeaway from this. So let's say you're looking at a helium atom. When you shine light onto it, it reflects, scatters photons off of it of a specific color. Sodium uh, does the same thing, scatters photons, but they have a different color. So by looking at the color of the light, bouncing off the atom, or what color the gas glows, you can determine what it's made out of. Helium will have this purple color. Sodium will have this yellow color. Sodium lamps at industrial sites and street lamps used to all be yellow because they had sodium lamps in them. And uh, the primary emission of light from sodium electrons is yellow. Um, what about this one? Neon, right? Scatters red light. So a neon sign, on air, open, uh, whatever. Uh, vacancy. The 
red light comes from the neon itself. So by looking at the color coming from a gas, you can determine what it's made out of. So that's your other key thing. How do we know what Alpha Centauri is made out of? Well, we have the color of it, from the spectrum of it, the black body spectrum, the peak of that tells us its temperature, and the color can tell us what it's made out of or what atoms it contains. This means that every atom, every single one, has its own unique fingerprint. This fingerprint is its color. No atom glows with the same color. Neon is neon. There's no other atom that glows like neon, okay? Uh, let's see. This is the periodic table of elements. There's hydrogen and helium and lithium and beryllium and boron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and uh, chloride and uh, neon. And all of these things have their, um, have their colors, their own specific spectral colors. This is the periodic table, but their color spectrum. So that rainbow, um, normally that rainbow, uh, white light shows into a rainbow, but not all light is white light. Not all light is composed of all the colors. So this is showing you all the different colors for these atoms. So you can see hydrogen just has a few colors present. Helium has a few more. Um, the he heavier the element gets, the more complex the spectrum gets. Um, but that's what spectroscopy is doing, is trying to create this chart, trying to understand what atoms emit what colors. Okay, so the scientific process of observing the fingerprints and the colors of atoms is called spectroscopy. And you have your incoming light coming in, being refracted by the prism, separates it into the, all the colors. And this is an example of hydrogen. It's got kind of a pink purple color. There's a prism here, and then it splits it into not a full rainbow, but just a few colors. And that's its fingerprint. Where, how far apart these colors are from each other, that's, what, that's how you know you're looking at hydrogen. Okay, so what? Well, this means that we can determine what something is made out of just by looking at it. In other words, the light emitted by an object tells us what it's made out of. Then we can determine what a star is made out of, or a galaxy, or a diffuse gas, or a nebula, or whatever, all without actually going there. Okay, so this is, if you have white light put through a prism, it gives you what's called a continuous spectrum. It looks like a rainbow. Hydrogen has very specific colors. One red, a cyan color, a blue one, a UV one. Um, sodium, look at that, mostly in yellow. That's why sodium has those yellow lights. Mercury has all the colors present, red, green, and blue here. And that's why sometimes you'll see in light bulbs it says mercury is present. And that's, uh, we put mercury in light bulbs because it makes a nice white color by having red, green, and blue present. Okay, um, so the three kinds of spectra, the continuous spectra, that's the rainbow, an absorption spectrum, and an emission spectrum. An emission spectrum is when you heat something up, it glows. An absorption spectrum is when it's something cold and you shine light on it and it absorbs it. So um, these are, you have to learn these terms because depending on the observation we make and talk about in class, if you're going to look at like a sun, a star, has a continuous spectrum. That's what it looks like. If the light from a star goes through a cloud of gas, then you're going to see an absorption spectrum because the light is going to be absorbed by the gas, but most of it's going to pass through. So you're going to still see the rainbow, but some of it's going to be missing because the gas absorbed that light. If you're off here at the side, then this light is going to go through here, but then the gas is going to heat up and then emit those missing lines, and you're going to see those lines glowing. So there's the continuous spectrum, uh, an absorption spectrum, and the uh, emission spectrum. So those are the three types of spectrum. This is what the sun's atmosphere looks like. If you look at the sun, uh, the spectrum from the sun, it's the full continuous spectrum, but there's a lot of things missing from it, and that's because there's some elements in the atmosphere absorbing the light before it gets to us. So we can study what the atmosphere of the sun is made out of by studying uh, what elements are missing from its spectrum. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the structure of the atom. Uh, the structure of the atom, what we want to understand is describe the structure of atoms, and then explain how electrons interact with atoms, how they jump between energy levels. So J.J. Thompson discovered the electron in 1897. He had a cathode ray tube and, and magnets. He shined this beam of electrons, put a magnet on it, it deflected them. He realized they're negatively charged. Um, and then Ernest Rutherford discovered the nucleus of an atom in 1911. He shot these particles at a piece of gold foil, and most of them went through, but every now and then one of them struck back, and then he realized that there's there's something in there really dense to cause these 
particles to bounce back, and that's when they realized that there was um, a very dense nucleus and then a lot of empty space. So most of those particles go through, but every now and then, dink, one of them hits the nucleus and bounces back. So that was a big deal. Um, the hydrogen atom, remember, is one proton, one electron. Um, the helium atom is two protons, two electrons, um, and then there's usually two neutrons in there. There are isotopes, which means you just have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. It's the same element, for example, this is all hydrogen. These are isotopes of hydrogen, and they have names. Usually they don't have names, but hydrogen is special. Uh, we give them names, so there's hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. Otherwise, you just call it H1, H2, H3, um, and that refers to the different uh, uh, isotopes. So what is an isotope? Just different numbers of neutrons, but the proton number is what determines the element. Okay, so the Bohr atom, the main idea is that electrons have specific energy levels. Electrons orbit the nucleus with specific energy levels, and electrons can transition between those energy levels um, between, uh, as long as they absorb or emit a photon. That's the key. So the key idea is that an electron absorbs exactly the right energy to jump up or emits exactly the right energy to jump down to an energy level. So if an electron wants to go from, let's say, energy level 3 to energy level 7, it needs to absorb... Uh, four units of light energy to jump up to there. And then if it wants to go back down, let's say it's at level 8 and it wants to go down to level 2, it needs to emit six units of energy in the form of a photon. The color of light corresponds to that energy. So a photon with six units of energy is going to have a very specific color, no other color. So we can measure the transition in an atom by measuring the light that comes out of it because that corresponds to the gap in energy levels. So. 5.5, the formation of these spectral lines that we've been talking about, we want to understand how emission line spectra and absorption line spectra are formed, and we want to describe what ions are and how they are formed, and we want to explain how spectral lines and ionization levels in a gas can help us determine its temperature. So this is a diagram of uh, the hydrogen atom. So you have the nucleus here um, at the very center, and then you, got, you can imagine electrons orbiting at the n equals 1 stage, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, so those are the energy levels, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and you can jump from 5 to 4, 5 to 3, 5 to 2, 4 to 5, 5 to 1, 1 to 3, and so on. Every time you make a transition, though, you have to either absorb or emit the right amount of photons if it's available to you. Okay, so let's say you take hydrogen gas, and this is a, a tube with hydrogen in it, it's a light bulb filled with hydrogen, put a prism, that's the spectrum you see. The light hits the prism, gets split, and then you see those spectrum showing up. And that's the emission spectrum of hydrogen. And there they are, very specific wavelengths, 656 nanometers, that's uh, it's literally how far apart the waves are. Um, we call that the Balmer series. This is the spectral fingerprint of hydrogen. All elements have their own unique fingerprint. So that's hydrogen. There's those four, one, two, three, four lines. There's helium. A couple more in there, including this yellow line. There, there's uh, mercury. There's the orange and red, yellow, green, blue. That's what makes it nice and white. And then there's uh, uranium. Very complex. Lots of electrons um, to jump between lots of different energy levels. So the more energy levels, the more electrons you have, the more complicated your uh, emission spectra looks like. This is the full spectrum of hydrogen. The Balmer series is what you can see with your eyes, but there's one way down here, the passion, all these different series uh, of light from all the different energy level jumps. So for example, to jump from 3 to 2, you get the red line. From 4 to 2, you get the blue line, uh, cyan line. From 5 to 2, you get the blue line, and from 6 to 2, you get the ultraviolet line. That's called the Balmer series. Any uh, electron that ends in n equals 2 is a visible light uh, photon from hydrogen. Um, the passion series is uh, when the photons end at energy level 3. You can't see it with your eyes. They're um, out of our visible range. The Lyman series, the bracket series, and so on. So those are all the different uh, colors that come off of hydrogen. And why? Because their photons are jumping, uh, the electrons are jumping energy levels. And in order to do so, they have to emit or absorb light to do it. So those are your emission and absorption spectra. Um, is, there's, you can think of photons as the keys, and the electrons need those keys to jump up and down. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about here is the Doppler effect. So we want to understand why the spectral lines of photons we observe from an object change as the object moves. So we want to describe how we can use the Doppler effect to deduce how fast astronomical objects are moving through space. 
Um, the idea here is that motion affects waves. This is called the Doppler effect. Motion changes the perceived frequency of a wave, and since frequency determines the color, it changes the perceived color. So this is some guy moving towards someone radiating waves. Okay, and let's just go back, and what you pay attention to is blink, 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 blink. Every time it crosses a peak, it blinks. But now when it's moving away, look how blink, blink, blink. Look how much slower it perceives. Pink, 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 pink. It's running into the wave, so it, they appear to be hitting him at a higher frequency. So he perceives the light to be higher frequency as he's moving away, lower frequency. So the Doppler effect is just, it's an illusion, it's a perception. Um, due to your relative motion. Why is that important? Because we can figure out how fast someone is moving based on this. It's how radar guns work with the police, um, and it's how we uh, measure this relative motion of stars compared to us. Either something moves towards us or away from us. We know what hydrogen should look like. We know what its fingerprint should look, should look like. If it's slightly shifted towards us or slightly shifted away from us, then we know that that star is moving towards us or that star is moving away from us. So we can use the Doppler effect to measure how fast something is moving either towards us or away from us. Um, that's all I have, and uh, that's all I have, so I'll see you guys uh, next time. Bye.